When severe weather strikes, there are those first to respond. They are rescuers. Rockway, completely destroyed, you know, uh, breezy. I saw the water coming up in the morning. We had over two feet of water on the first floor, so the entire basement was destroyed. They are heroes. We're just here to try to sort things out and make it better. They are warriors. That's what we focus on, the dirty, unsexy work of, of cleaning out a home and giving someone, their family, a vision of what the future could be. Part of a family of first responders is really an honor. Um, my husband, Sean's dad, was also a firefighter, New York City firefighter, Brooklyn. And he served for 23 years. He was also in the Air Force. And then Sean became a firefighter, I think because of his dad. He remembers those nights of his dad coming home and smelling of smoke and the stories and he gravitated towards the fire department. And I think part of the reason is, is because it's what he knew and what he loved. He has a serving heart. He puts out products with the FDNY that kind of give a heads up on events that are about to happen in New York City. And there are many times that he asks me about what the forecast is going to be like. So that's when our jobs complement each other. I remember being one of the first on-air people to deliver the news that Sandy was going to hit New York City. I remember when the National Hurricane Center came out with their first forecast showing that left-hand curve, which doesn't happen very often. It was with John Scott 10 years ago. Janice Dean has the latest from the Extreme Weather Center. If this track comes true, it is the worst case scenario, John. Now, we still have days to go and a lot of information to kind of input into this tracking. But right now, this storm looks like it's going to be headed for millions of people. It's going to be a transitioning system, meaning that perfect storm type scenario. The authorities here have been appealing for people all day to get out. Hurricane Sandy, that storm already slamming Cuba. Now we have brand new tracking, which shows where this massive system might be headed next. People want to believe that this is not happening. It's happening, absolutely, folks. 50 million people preparing for the worst. They've got New York City basically shut down. The National Hurricane Center came out with their update, and it showed that incredible curve many days out. And I remember saying to the producer, Clint, I got on my earpiece and I had my microphone on. I said, we have to go to air right now, right at the top of the, right at the top of the hour. We are now talking about a subtropical storm. It is transitioned from a tropical storm to an extra tropical storm. So it, instead of a warm core, it has a cold core. So this storm is strengthening. And yes, unfortunately, it looks like the worst of it could come at high tide along those very vulnerable storm surge prone regions. And I remember at the top of 11 o'clock when that first update came in, going on air for several minutes and talking about the potential catastrophic damage that something like this could do to millions of people. And the fact that it was going to be a transitioning storm not just a hurricane, but almost a hybrid of a nor'easter and a hurricane. An absolutely devastating scene in Queens where 50 homes have been destroyed by fire, 55-0. This, this might be the most pressing situation right now in the entire tri-state. Half an hour ago, we showed you this um, NYPD scuba team that was over here, and, and they were here um, in scuba gear to be able to get through that water to get to houses to free people who were trapped. It's the worst nightmare. Unbelievable. You couldn't imagine what, what it's like. It's, you know, f there's three feet of water all around. Uh, houses are burned down in the middle. It's, it's terrible. If you're in meteorology and you see that perfect storm scenario, you know it can be extremely dangerous and even deadly. So I went on television and delivered my forecast and, and took heat for it. Uh, took a lot of heat for it because uh, I was deemed as um, fear mongering and hyping it up. And the forecast came true. It 
it was right. While we continue our coverage of the trail of devastation left by Hurricane Sandy, take a look at the flooding in Lower Manhattan. This is in Battery Park. This wall of water, 13-foot surge of water that came across uh, Battery Park into the World Trade Center construction site, turning uh, some of these construction areas into raging waterfalls. Every house is lift off the foundation, windows crashed in, the whole front of the houses are gone. I never thought that I'd be in my own community, in my own city, on a boat, rescuing people from their roofs. Well, we continue our coverage of the trail of devastation left by Hurricane Sandy. 22 years I'm in my home, and I lost it. I don't have anything, anywhere to go. I don't have no clothes. All the clothes I have on, they, let, they gave it to me at the evacuation center. My most important role is delivering information that can help save lives. And so I take that really seriously. And so when someone will say to me, I can tell when you're serious and I can tell when you need to tell people to be careful. We just didn't realize the magnitude of Hurricane Sandy. I mean, you couldn't see anything but water. I mean, it was like, being in, a, in an ocean, a lake here, was just completely submerged in water. As we're walking, there's cars floating by. Um, I'm running into cars underwater. Some people, all they had left was a bag of clothes in a plastic bag. People on the, on the roof of their homes. And I'm talking the roof of their homes. Basement gone, first floor gone people with seven, three feet, four feet, five feet of water in their first floor up above their house. All the papers that we had in the, di in the dinette set, it's all floating. The, uh, the gas stove is floating. The uh, washer and dryer is floating. Everything. First responders and military. And, you know, it's something that uh, is close to my heart. And so it's putting those two things together. I do the weather, I talk about a disaster that is about to happen, and they're the ones that go out and help afterwards. And they also talk about preparation. That's really important. That's what I do as well, how to prepare for an event before it actually happens. They do the same thing. So it combines everything that I love, what my husband does, a serving heart, and also helping those after the storm. Coming up, a family of first responders answers the call. You know, we just kept, you know, house to house, getting rid of the water. At Fox Weather, no matter the situation, we've got you covered. Through the best and worst weather and everything in between. We're all in this together. Because there's nothing more important to us than keeping you safe. From morning forecasts to holiday travel, we're here for you. We have a passion for weather and a passion for people. That's why we love what we do. Fox Weather, weathering it together. Absolutely devastating scene in Queens where 50 homes have been destroyed by fire, 55-0. This, this might be the most pressing situation right now in the entire tri-state. The sixth alarm fire ripped through a flooded neighborhood in Breezy Point. Rows and rows of homes completely destroyed. Now we have brand new tracking, which shows where this massive system might be headed next. You really think, we're ready, but, you know, probably are never going to have to do this. Boy, were we wrong. Sandy was a disaster. It was just total chaos. To this day, I've had people say, I remember when you had that forecast about Sandy, and I listened. I listened to you. That's the greatest compliment you could give me. And there was incredible damage and devastation along the Northeast Coast. First responders from all over the New York area sprung into action, including a family of heroes, whom I met at Farrell's, a legendary spot in Brooklyn, New York. The Hegan brothers, thank you for being with me today. Thank you. Let's, let's start off with you, Joe, and tell me about your service. Currently a lieutenant, uh, New York City Fire Department, uh, Ladder 149 in Dyker Heights, Brooklyn. I've been there for 12 years, since around 09, okay. 10. Yeah, I got promoted in 09. Yeah, I'm Bill, the oldest of these three right here. And I'm retired five years. I worked um, with EMS. I was an EMT and then a paramedic for 25 years. 
and um, now I'm working on the next chapter of life. So, yeah. It's very nice. What's the next chapter, you think? I'm still working on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've been a fire marshal for the last six months. Got promoted. I worked 20 years in Borough Park. I was in the Marine Corps prior to that. It's not rare to have service in the family, but to see three brothers that are, you know, essentially doing the same type of work, uh, you know, where does where does that come from? Uh, it comes from, you know, a sense of, you know, wanting to help other people. Um, we grew up in a, a close-knit neighborhood uh, where we knew a lot of firemen and police officers. We had several uh, uncles that were police officers. Yeah, our, our dad was, uh, he was one of nine that grew up on 15th Street here in the neighborhood. Seven brothers, uh, six brothers, seven boys. And they all did time in the military right when they were of age. And out of the seven, three of them were police officers. Um, we had a cousin John, he was the first one, went into the fire department, you know, before all of us did, so. Uh, and then in the neighborhood here itself, it was, when growing up, it was very much a blue collar civil service back in the 70s and 80s. And, yeah. You know, so you grew up around that atmosphere of, of civil service in public. And the Hegans were called to the ultimate service on 9-11. What's that like looking back 20 years ago? It's, it's hard to imagine that it was that long ago. Sometimes you think about it and it was like, you know, like they say, like yesterday, you know, you, things come up. You know, somber, just past the uh, anniversary, so there's a lot of reflection there. First time my husband told my kids about where he was and what happened to his firehouse was the 20th anniversary. It was the first time when we were driving to his firehouse that he was able to give them, you know, to this day I really don't know all the details he doesn't Be share, sure. but it was a moment that I don't forget because it was finally letting the boys know like where his dad was and and what happened afterwards those are important historic moments that we can't forget welcome right. back everyone it is uh, 9 24 right now uh we are looking at that fire which took out 50 homes in breezy point late last night of course, an awful scene, and uh, most first responders helpless to put out the flames. They were involved in rescues, heroic rescues, but uh, just a tragic, uh, a tragic result of this storm rolling. Hurricane Sandy, 10-year anniversary coming up this year. Um, you know, tell me, tell me what happened in in your area. Uh, well, Rockway completely destroyed. You know, uh, breezy. I saw the water coming up in the morning probably about three or four inches, so you kind of knew that night it was gonna be a little bit worse. Took the family, went to Brooklyn, to my, uh, my mother-in-law's, and uh, yeah, we stayed in Brooklyn that night, but I came back the next day to find, we had over two feet of water on the first floor, so the entire basement was destroyed. You know, putting the uh, furniture up on crates in the basement really didn't you know, help at all. You know, thinking maybe get six inches of water or something like that, and uh, the basement kind of collapsed on it. But uh, again, after that, pumping out neighbors' basements. You know, there was a guy that came by that was hired, and he had a truck with a, a generator and a, a big pump. So he pumped out my house and my next door neighbor, but he was getting exhausted at that point. So uh, he was talking about leaving, and I just grabbed another fireman friend and. We were like, can we use it? Like, we know how to use your tools. And he was like, all right. And he just took a nap in the back of his truck. And we went to the old lady across the street and we helped her out. And then the Cunningham's next to them. And, you know, we just kept, you know, house to house, getting rid of the water, trying the best you could, you know. And then for the weeks and months, you know, ripping up hardwood floors, you know, from your neighbors because, you know, it looks fine. But then once you rip up that first layer and you see the, the mold, um, these houses are all 100 years old. So you have the, original floors and then uh, linoleum floor and then another wood floor and everybody just kept adding nobody took it the floor away so the uh, the amount of mold and, and stuff that was buried in it the, everything had to be ripped out of the houses people don't understand that haven't gone through something like that that it, it really is like layers of work that you right. have to do are you back in uh, yeah so uh, we it took us a couple of years we we thought it'd be every time we kept reimagining it. It was always like two months away. It wound up being closer to two years before we were able to rebuild our house. That's it. We were just helping friends and family for, for weeks and weeks. Uh, it, was, it was a sight to see. 
And then after it was over, I just, you know, as soon as we could, we, you know, it was safe enough, we made our way down to Rockaway and just helping out, not only with Gary, but with anyone else we knew, other guys from the firehouse, a lot of friends and family down that area, over in Staten Island as well, which got hit hard. And so on your off days, you were just helping out. And then, you know, when you were back at work, uh, you, in your area, you would respond and help as much as you could. Yeah, in, in that community, in the days afterwards, uh, besides the fire, people from the fire department, Santage, probably showing up, you had volunteer firehouses from Connecticut, Jersey, like all over the place, coming up, like on my corner, setting up a couple of tents, generators, you know, food, water, uh, socks, underwear, just simple things, bringing them there. And then the, um, one of the clubs, uh, the Bell Harbor Yacht Club, they had, it was kind of in ruins on the first floor, but the second floor was a place where everybody could drop stuff off. I mean, diapers, formula, the, just so many different things that people needed and they just didn't have access to any of it. I mean, there was no gas at the time, you couldn't drive your car anywhere, you know, all the stores and everything were underwater, so simple necessities just weren't that simple. Um, it was a very difficult time for a lot of people. Yeah, but again, I see it all the time when tragedy happens, it's like that's when you see the best in humanity, right? Yeah. That's when you see human beings coming out and helping each other. Absolutely. What do you tell a person who wants to get into your field of work? What advice do you give them? I would just tell them to definitely give it a shot. Uh, a lot of times people are tentative, they're not sure. Uh, like we spoke about earlier, the, the gratification is there. Um, make sure you're dedicated, make sure you're all in. I would still tell people it's, it's, a, it's the best job on the planet. I mean, they feel like family to me, right? They're the, they're the guys that, um, that are at my dinner table. Um, and so I felt really comfortable with them um, because I'm around those people. There's no pretense about them. They are, you know, salt of the earth, wonderful people that care about each other, that want to help others. And I just feel so fortunate to be part of something like that. Coming up, the call back to service. I think it takes the best parts of the military. It just gives uh, an even playing field for those uh, who served and who didn't to be able to come together and, and do really great things for people who truly need it. The Fox Weather app. Make sure your Fox Weather notifications are on. Not just a forecast, an experience easily accessible with the tap of a finger. Only as time passes, this is going to get worse. The power of the storm is to be unleashed. Fast, reliable, and best of all, tailored to your location and your needs. We do appreciate you joining us here on Fox Weather. Fox Weather, we've got you covered. Download the free app now and make it your own. Hurricane Harvey, where we had unprecedented rainfall in the Houston area. And I wanted to go cover that because I lived in Houston for a number of years. I have good friends there that are almost like family. And I pitched to Fox and Friends that I wanted to go out and assess the damage. And that's how I was introduced to Team Rubicon. And they were, they were doing incredible work for people that wouldn't necessarily be able to get help because of their they don't have the money to do it, you know, so they're going into these very vulnerable areas that are, have been inundated with water, and these people really have lost everything. Um, so that's how I was introduced to them, and I feel like they're part of my family. Team Rubicon was founded by Jake Wood and others responding to the devastating earthquake in Haiti more than a decade ago. Matt Colvin is Team Rubicon's head of strategic partnerships. I recently sat down with him in New York City. Thanks for coming, Matt. Absolutely, thank you for having me. So what have you been up to these last few weeks? Uh, Team Rubicon's really busy. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of different things going on across the world. Everything from assistance with the Ukraine crisis, helping medical providers over there, teaching medical providers to be able to expand kind of the medical knowledge that's over there and uh, really help with some of the, the administrative and logistical aspects of things that are happening there. That's incredible because when I met you guys, we were down in around Houston 
for Hurricane Harvey several years ago when we had like over 46 inches of rain mm -hmm. and it just inundated parts of Southeast Texas. People were out of their homes and you know still rebuilding and to see what you're doing now with a war, that's incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, we've really, we've, we've come a long way in the last 12 years of our existence and uh, from the very origins of uh, Team Rubicon, you know, 12 years ago, supporting the earthquake in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So now rebuilding in Houston, you know, that was a big, a huge operation for us that really brought us to national relevance. And we've been supporting Houston ever since, really from when the rainfall ended and the, the floodwaters started to recede all the way to now, I think we've, uh, we've helped about 120 different families get back into their homes just in the Houston area. It was incredible to watch families see you guys come in with your gray shirts. Uh, and I remember a lot of them saying, I don't have any money to pay you. I mean, it was heartbreaking. Yeah, well, our, our services are free. Um, and being a, a, a smaller organization, a younger organization, you know, not everybody knew who we were or what we did, uh, but we provide free disaster services to those who are impacted by, you know, natural disasters and humanitarian crisis. And uh, it was a simple knock on the door uh, by a friendly person in a gray shirt, one of these, and allowing them to understand that we're there to help. And you go into, you know, uh, lower income families, people that can't afford this kind of rebuild. Yeah, that's really the focus of Team Rubicon, is thinking about the inequities of disaster, humanitarian crisis, and, and helping those that are disproportionately affected. People living in floodplains, uh, the impoverished, those with multiple generations within a home. You know, those are the people that we focus on because they usually fall through the cracks. Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon River as he went to take Rome. Jake Wood and, and seven other individuals who basically hitchhiked their way down into the Dominican Republic came to a river that naturally separates Dominican Republic from Haiti. And that ended up being their Rubicon. Crossing over that river into Haiti after the 2010 earthquakes, one of the largest earthquakes to ever hit the Western Hemisphere, they knew that that was their point of no return. And so, like Julius Caesar, they said that this is where we burn our boats, we're not looking back, and we're gonna continue on. Um, so that's where Team Rubicon and the origin of the name uh, you know, came to be. That was their first mission? Yes, that was. Mm -hmm. And his service helped him with drafting people like himself. Yeah, it's, it's a natural fit, uh, you know, for those that are military within our ranks. Uh, we have 150,000 volunteers throughout the country, throughout the world. About 70% of them are, are veterans, uh, some sort of service. I talked to some of those volunteers and they say that life after service, they didn't realize how much they missed it and how much they realize that they have a serving heart that they want to continue even after retirement. Yeah. Serving again with purpose is so meaningful for so many. I myself, I'm a veteran. I struggled with the transition after leaving the military and a couple tours in Afghanistan. And, you know, I outgrew friends and family. Um, I didn't quite understand how to come back into society. They train you to be in the military. They don't train you to leave. And this is a landing spot for so many. And that's what we see consistently is that people come to Team Rubicon for the camaraderie, not just for the service, the community, the like-minded individuals, the safe space that it provides people to be able to talk about their service. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that you don't have a transition from the military with those who weren't in the military. And that's the great part of what Team Rubicon does. It provides an avenue for those who never served to learn from those who have. I think it takes the best parts of the military removes a lot of the BS and just gives uh, an even playing field for those uh, who served and who didn't to be able to come together and, and do really great things for people who truly need it. Tell me about your service. Uh, well, I was in the Air Force. Uh, I happened to join the military on 9-11. Just happened to be there the, the day everything happened. Um, so a swift indoctrination into the military. Uh, from there, I went on to be an airborne crypto linguist. Uh, what that really means is um, you know, radio communications, uh, raid coordination, uh, counter improvised explosive device sweeps, things like that. Um, so I had two tours in Afghanistan, and when I got out in 2007, it was, uh, you know, again, a struggle in the transition, but I'd, I found my purpose and my want to, to serve again through helping nonprofits. Tell me about the tools uh, you have over another organization, like, say, the Red Cross. 
Well, the Red Cross and Team Rubicon do very different things. You think about the immediate aftermath or the prep for a storm. You know, people evacuate. Naturally, they're going to gravitate to probably a Red Cross shelter. Food, water, you know, shelter in the immediate time frames that are there. Uh, as those people, those family members are uh, within those shelters, you know, there's someone, a group that would need to really help the homes. That's what we focus on, the dirty, unsexy work of, of cleaning out uh, a home and giving someone, their family, a vision of what the future could be. And that's what Team Rubicon does. Tell me about Hurricane Sandy. That's the, the 10 year anniversary is coming up from that. Yeah. Yeah, it's again another another hard to believe moment uh, that you would see such a tremendous storm come up, uh, you know, through the mid-Atlantic and to strike New Jersey and New York as it did. Um, that was another major, major time frame for Team Rubicon. Um, it was really all cards on the table. We needed to figure out how we could help. It was a do or die moment for the organization itself and Jake and the rest of uh, those that were were there during that time frame. Just put everything out there and said, let's go help. You know, very quickly we recruited almost 5,000 individuals to come and join in along the shorelines of New York and New Jersey and to help people starting to, uh, to respond and you know, eventually recover. So that was a huge moment for Team Rubicon where we gained national relevance. Uh, New York, the tri-state area really understood you know, that there was a young startup organization who was out there just willing to extend a hand and help those that were in need. And you were affected. I was. Uh, yeah, I was infected by Hurricane Sandy. I, I was living in Hoboken, New Jersey at the time and in the flood zone in, in the back of, of Hoboken. My apartment with uh, several roommates flooded. I lost a lot of my stuff. Nothing too important. All of my military gear was, was still intact. Uh, but I was left homeless and basically couch surfing for about four months. So I slept between friends' homes. Uh, and even in my place of work <laughs> here in, in Manhattan for, for quite some time. But I found a young Team Rubicon just a few days, a few weeks after Hurricane Harvey had assembled out in the far Rockaways, and um, that's where I started my Team Rubicon journey. Wow. You know, being out in a, a flood zone, a disaster area, you see some really awful things, but uh, you also see the best in humanity, right? You absolutely do. Thinking about some of the best parts of Team Rubicon are the hugs after you've provided somebody with a service that they just never thought would come. It's a, a feeling that there's not much to compare it to. Uh, you know, we bring in strangers from all over the country to help strangers in their own communities. I remember the hugs the most when I was out there. I loved meeting the people, but the hugs that were going on in the communities, um, it, you can't even really put a word on it or describe it. You have to be there to, to really see it. That's the plan for us going forward is to really be the glue, be a part of the fabric of what America is. Thinking of us, as we say it internally, hopefully as the next generation of the Volunteer Firefighter Corps within any community within the United States. Mm -hmm. And Fox Weather is teaming up with Team Rubicon as well. We're going to help the organization build Meteorologists have a job to do by warning the public of these storms, but also partnering up with organizations like Team Rubicon to help you with the forecast and perhaps the next disaster. It really is it's such a valuable relationship and you know, you've done so much to really help people understand what Team Rubicon does. So thank you for telling this story and for allowing me here today to talk a little bit more about you know, our organization and our mission. Well, I think I've told you that my husband is, you know, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know why I got upset, but um, my husband's going to retire soon, and he said the first place he's going to call is Team Rubicon, so I hope you'll have him. We can't wait to have him. And any <laughs> of his you know, friends and those that have served alongside, um, for you as well. You know, there's a place here for so many, and we welcome that opportunity to, to have him out there with us. Coming up, service driven by faith. The number eight in the Bible means new beginnings. Uh, during those eight days, we brought new beginnings to 84 families. Thousands of families waiting for somebody, anybody, to bring them an ounce of hope.
Hello, Fox Weather users. I'm Janice Dean. The Fox Weather app is changing the game with custom features you've got to take advantage of. I'm here to guide you through these features so you can get the most out of your Fox Weather experience. Let me tell you about my favorite feature on the Fox Weather app, Future View. Fox Future View is a feature you can't find anywhere else. With a few simple steps, Future View allows you to track the weather in advance of any big events you have planned for the year. Going on vacation? Booking your honeymoon? Maybe a destination wedding or party? This is the perfect tool to help you plan ahead. Get a future forecast anywhere in the world nearly a year in advance. Here's how it works. Hit the Plan tab at the bottom of your screen. Then hit Create Event. Give it a name. Let's say Spring Break Trip. Then add a location, maybe to Miami. Pick a start and end date. Add a category and turn on notifications so we can alert you as your event gets closer. Then click Create. That's it. Give it a try now. This is just one of many great features the Fox Weather app provides to you. This app is full of all kinds of great customizable tools. So dive in and make the Fox Weather app your very own. Fox Weather, weathering it together. There are just some areas that get really hit hard, uh, some harder than others. Louisiana, really vulnerable uh, coastline. It's what you don't see afterwards of people, neighbors coming out and helping others. It's the best of humanity. That's what happens after a storm hits. And these are the type of people that want to help others. That's what my colleague Mitty Hicks found with a group called Eight Days of Hope. Blue tarp used as temporary roofs to cover homes. Power lines are still down. All of this damage is nearly one year after Hurricane Ida devastated this community here in Laplace, Louisiana. We're just 30 minutes west of New Orleans, where there are hundreds in this town of about 30,000 people. Few still waiting for help as construction crews are backed up. The storm destroying not just homes, but lives. Honestly, I'm gonna tell you, I couldn't go in the house. I mean, when I opened the door, I had to, I had to close it. I couldn't even go in. It was too, it was too much for me to even, to even absorb. Lauren Bro serves in the medical unit for the Louisiana National Guard. She answered the call to serve in the military because she's always enjoyed helping people. Her career moves her all around the state, but Laplace became her home in 2019. And with this home, she hoped to create new memories with a family. But her dreams put on hold as she cleans up the damage from Hurricane Ida. What did your home look like when Hurricane Ida hit? <sighs> um, total destruction, total devastation, things that were supposed to be in its rightful place was toppled upside down. Lauren was out on deployment when the storm made landfall. She stayed on base because it was the safest place and finally made it back to her home a few days after the storm passed. She remembers her front door covered with water, trash and debris on the front yard. She couldn't enter her home, and not just because of the physical barriers, but the emotional ones. Lord, how am I gonna do this? How am I going to um, put one foot in front of the other? How am I going to, how am I gonna make it? At that point, I didn't know what I was gonna do. Lauren, who relies heavily on her Christian faith, says she asks these questions every night in her prayers. Her prayers finally answer nearly eight months after Hurricane Ida, when volunteers from the organization Eight Days of Hope knocked on her door. The volunteers are adding new flooring, building a fence, cleaning debris, and replacing appliances. This is an unbelievable experience. 
a new start, a new beginning. It's more than um, words can express, really. I'm used to being on the other end of service and uh, to actually get um, service. Uh, it's different on the other side. As the volunteers okay. work so in her home, the there are Bible scriptures written on the walls for her encouragement. Lauren, can you read this scripture for me? What does it say? It says, your cries have been awakened by the master. Love you, sis. What does that scripture mean for you? That the Lord heard my cry, you know, that the Lord heard what, uh, the desires of my heart knowing that I needed the help. Eight Days of Hope is a faith-based organization that started when the founder, Steve Tiber, saw people in need after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. The plan originally was my dad living in New York. I was living in Mississippi at the time. Our goal was to help out a widow, an elderly couple or a single mom. It was just to help out one family right after Katrina. I mean, it's the right thing to do. You see a community just devastated. And you, need, and you need to do your part. And so that was the original plan. But very quickly, we realized that there was a much bigger plan developing. That trip was supposed to be his family and a few friends, but word of his mission got out fast. More than 680 volunteers stepped up during the first year. The number eight in the Bible means new beginnings. Uh, during those eight days, we brought new beginnings to 84 families. And when I left Bay St. Louis, Mississippi in 2005, and, and I saw the volunteers using their gifts to bless others, help the brokenhearted who had nowhere to turn. They didn't have insurance. Uh, maybe they, you know, they were people who were recovering from cancer. They were single moms with no family. Like, where do we go? Where do we turn? And I just thought, wait a minute. You don't have to complicate things. People are looking to help. So how can you, meaning me and the other leaders, find ways to connect people who want to help with people who need help? And the ministry Eight Days of Hope was born. 17 years later, the work hasn't stopped. Eight Days has at least 50,000 volunteers who have responded to more than 60 natural disasters nationwide. From wildfires in the West to the devastating tornado in 2021 in Mayfield, Kentucky, they have helped nearly 9,000 families rebuild their homes for free and are often the first on scene responding to natural disasters. So what are you all doing here? We're loading up fence packets to, so that the team lead can go over and rebuild a fence for uh, some homeowner somewhere here in the parish. Fred, how long have you been doing this with Eight Days of Hope? Three years, three and a half years. What keeps you coming back? God. That's God. We're just doing what God's calling us to do. This is the organization's second mission to Louisiana for Hurricane Ida because the need is so great. Some volunteers are answering the call to help in their own backyard. Coming to help out the community because you've been through it so many times and you see so many people go through the same thing. Other volunteers are following what the Christian faith calls the golden rule. Treat others as you want to be treated. If we were in that situation, and we could very easily be in that situation, we're in Tornado Alley in Mississippi, Hurricane. so it could happen to us. I would want people to come and help, and uh, I can't imagine the devastation that they feel, but uh, to know that people care makes a huge difference. These volunteers do this hard labor all out of love, but the work weighs heavy on their hearts, especially when they see so many people in need. So in between the work, volunteers worship three times a day. They say it's how they refill their cups when helping others recover from traumatic weather events. On this trip, you know it's going to be the hardest part is leaving. Our world is so distracted right now for some serious things, and I get it. I understand why the first five news stories are about things happening around the world, and I'm concerned and I'm praying. No one's talking about Hurricane Ida anymore. It's been seven and a half months. There's thousands of families waiting for somebody, anybody, to bring them an ounce of hope. Hope is what carried Tiber through his battle with addiction. He almost lost his marriage and his life. In 1993, I left my house to commit suicide. I was an addict. I had nowhere to turn. 
and he met me at my lowest point. And so that day, very clearly, I said yes to Jesus. And I said, pretty simple, help me with my addiction. You know, take it from me, restore my marriage. Let me be a better father, and I'm going to serve you to the day I die. And so I'm just living out my commitment. Helping others and giving hope isn't always about the physical labor. Sometimes the smallest gesture and the youngest volunteers make the biggest impact. What's been the best part? Um, how we're working. Working. You're six. Wow. Are you the six-year-old? You like to work? And then your big brother. What's been the best part for you? Um. Just giving joy to people. It's important, right? Um, we were told that we couldn't do anything once we had kids, and we have five of them here, and we are, you know, we may not be making a big difference, but we're making a small difference. So. Seeing children around her home is what Lauren says she needed. That is why I wanted to live here, to have a family, to have a kid. It's what I wanted, and. I'm actually going to get that back. I actually have a chance to get that back, to have that family that I, I so desperately want. So I appreciate y'all bringing that joy that I needed to see. I needed to see it. Thank y'all so much. Well, thank you for letting us. Thank you for letting us serve you. And we don't have an Auntie Lori, so Lori. <laughs> so, I mean, welcome to the family. Because we made some lifelong friends here. You can't do what we do and not leave unchanged. Just people helping others, and I think over the years, almost 20 years of covering weather disasters, it's what you don't see afterwards of people, neighbors coming out and helping others. It's the best of humanity. That's what happens after a storm hits. And these are the type of people that want to help others. Coming up, service as a family business. Sometimes I didn't even know what fire he was on. But when they did finally see each other, they were able to talk about things that others might not understand. At Fox Weather, no matter the situation, we've got you covered. Through the best and worst weather and everything in between. We're all in this together. Because there's nothing more important to us than keeping you safe. From morning forecasts to holiday travel, we're here for you. We have a passion for weather and a passion for people. That's why we love what we do. Fox Weather, weathering it together. In California, wildfires are part of the natural order. But when those fires spread, threatening homes, ancient trees, and lives, first responders are called into action. Fox Weather's Max Gordon knows that firsthand. From the uniformed pictures on our fridge. Did you want to drop start it? Just a little fire hazard reduction we do. To the everyday lessons I learned working out in the yard. See this little spot right here? That was the holding wood oh, right there. It? To the smoky clothes that filled our hamper. Wildland firefighting was always just a part of our family, shaping it in a lot of ways. But until now, I've never really gotten to sit down to talk with my parents about their careers, our family, and how it all started. How did you get into firefighting? Well, I got into firefighting because um, my brother was a Cal Fire firefighter, or at the time it was called CDF. And my dad in 1941, actually was a firefighter. So I heard about um, wildland firefighting from a, a early age, and it seemed like a good summer job for me. Dad started in 1971, and it was a very different department in those days. Um, I got hired, and at the time, there was no training at all. Um, the training was when you went to the station, they showed you where to sit on the fire engine. But times were changing. The fire service was becoming more professionalized, and women were starting to break into a job that had for a long time been dominated by men. I was raised in a family that assumed that I would go to college, which I did. I went to Dartmouth. I graduated. I thought, what am I going to do with myself? Well, everybody just goes to law school because that's what you do. And after my first year of law school, they said, this is your last chance to have any job you want. Don't work in a law firm. Get any old job. So. 
I thought that I was just going to be working on maybe like a hand crew, digging weeds or making trails, but it turned out it was firefighting. And one of the people who interviewed my mom for her first seasonal firefighting job, well, it was dad. Bruce was one of my interviewers and this old guy named Ed, and they said, can you cook? Because that's what firefighters do. All firefighters cook. But I thought it was because I was a woman. And I said, do you ask everyone that question? And I also asked that question because I don't cook, <laughs> at least not very well. And I was hoping we could just move on. <laughs> yeah, this, this is actually pretty funny because growing up, I always remember dad was the one who cooked everything. He is a cook. I can do brownies. I can bake. <laughs> <laughs> you do bake a really good brownie. Despite her lack of cooking skills, mom got that first seasonal firefighting job in 1980. She then graduated from UC Berkeley with a law degree and passed the bar, but realized she was meant to be on the fire line, not in the courtroom. I really loved the fact that when you came to work, you had no idea what the day had in store for you. You could be washing hose and the alarm would go off and you'd jump in the engine. You didn't know where the fire was going to be. And then you could be gone for two weeks. A job that kept the adrenaline pumping when the heat was on. You're going, feels like 100 miles an hour in the fire engine, you know, and all these cars are pulling off the way and you see this big plume of smoke, you know, you could see it over top of the cab of the engine, you know, because we're sitting in the back in the open air and, and uh, the adrenaline's pumping and you just go, what am I going to do? But along with a career, firefighting also led mom and dad to find each other. And the two got married in 1987. Most people didn't know we were married. There were a few that knew we were married. Um, and and for, we didn't want that to interfere with our, our um, working relationships with other people. Um, we wanted just to, 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 to um, be able to be judged on our own merits. Being married to a fellow wildland firefighter brought on its challenges. Mom and dad sometimes wouldn't see each other for weeks during the hectic fire season, and they often couldn't talk as they fought fire in remote areas during a time before cell phones. We would, somebody would say, yeah, I saw Edie on such and such fire uh, about a week ago. Sometimes I didn't even know what fire he was on. But when they did finally see each other, they were able to talk about things that others might not understand. The fact that you guys are able to speak the same language about your career and about the struggles of your career, do you feel like that's helped? Absolutely. And when something bad happened at work, you, you know, you had a disagreement with someone or things weren't going your way, you could come home and just launch right into it. But we did have a rule. We would come home, we would get it all out for about an hour and then just move on to doing things on our days off because you don't want work to take over your life. Did you guys ever talk about maybe like incidents that troubled you or like is, was that something that, that helped, you know, because you guys both were able to experience those same things sometimes on the job. We yeah. talked about everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, sometimes it was a struggle for whatever reason. I mean, I still remember when I saw my first dead person. I mean, it was shocking to me. It was my very first season. We also, we don't just go to fires. You go to medical aid, you go to car crashes. I mean, we specialize in wildland, but we see everything, structure fires. And it, it helps to talk to someone else. But maybe the biggest challenge to my parents' career came in 1993, when I arrived. Let's talk a little bit about me. <laughs> yes. How did I change your relationship and how did I change the way that you guys could be firefighters? Well, I went to the air attack base because I wouldn't be in direct smoke and flames and supervised a bunch of firefighters loading airplanes with fire retardant. But as I got larger and larger, there were no pregnancy uniforms. There still aren't, to my knowledge. After I stopped wearing dad's shirts, even got bigger than them, one of the kind of very large pilots gave me his jumpsuit. <laughs> so. I, I started wandering around in a pilot jumpsuit for pretty much the rest of my pregnancy. What was the biggest challenge when you were raising me and, and uh, being a firefighter? Anxious times and, and uh, um, it's just finding childcare. When I was young, I'd be bounced around between family and friends during fire season when mom and dad could be away fighting fires for weeks. Well, you just can't say, Max, uh, here's some food in the refrigerator because you're like three years old, <laughs> two years old. But one thing I never worried about, whether or not mom and dad would come back home. I never 
remember feeling scared for you guys or feeling like you guys were never gonna come home. I think because I understood what you did and I understood the things that kept you safe, the Nomex, the breathing apparatus, the fact that you guys had well-trained crews that looked out for each other, I was never scared that you weren't gonna come back. I always knew that you're gonna come back. I was never worried either. I think uh, uh, what we do is, is a lot of the, the operations we do are, are calculated risks. And I think we as humans do those every day. And, and with our training, I never did anything um, suicidal. For mom and dad, firefighting was a passion, but it was also a job, and they bristle when anyone calls them heroes. We're just here to try to sort things out and make it better. But I always looked up to them. My mom and dad inspired me to become a volunteer firefighter and to work as an EMT. To put myself in my parents' shoes and to see a little bit what your world was like from a first-person perspective, um, and it, it really taught me a lot. I found myself lucky to be able to talk to my parents about similar situations they'd experienced in their own careers. You are compiling some incredible experiences and then, then went on to become a volunteer and start running calls with our local fire department. Though my career path eventually took me in a different direction, asking questions for a living. I was real proud of you and, and, and you got a taste of it and thought, no, nope, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> <laughs> and that was good, I'm proud of you for that. Nowadays, things are a little different for mom and dad as well. Instead of fighting fire, they spend their time traveling, getting outdoors, and working on our apple orchard. Though, even now, they're still thinking about fire. Why did you want to put these in? Well, first off, I wanted uh, at least 3,000 gallons for fire protection. Any fire engine can tap into, and I have a little portable pump that I can use. What is your overall, just like, thought? Like, what's kind of like the overall feeling that, that you feel when, when you just think back on your career? For me, I'm just happy that I, that I was given that opportunity. I'm just really happy about it. I feel incredibly lucky. Thank you for hiring me. Yes. A family forged in flames, and a childhood spent sitting shotgun in engines and hanging out at the firehouse. I wouldn't have had it any other way. I love you guys. Love you too. Oh, that's it. That's all I got. It's the need to serve. Uh, it's a need to um, go beyond yourself and want to help other people. It's something that I think is you're born with. Uh, you have uh, empathy for other people. Um, you run towards danger instead of running away from it. Whether it's a call from a higher power. There's thousands of families waiting for somebody, anybody, to bring them an ounce of hope. A call back to service. Serving again with purpose is so meaningful for so many. I think it takes the best parts of the military, just gives uh, an even playing field for those uh, who served and who didn't to be able to come together and, and do really great things for people who truly need it. Or a family legacy. It's something that comes from deep within. It's a wonderful support group of people that you'll have in your life. They're your best friends, you love them, and they'll be in your life forever. We're just here to try to sort things out and make it better.